Good morning, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, I'm Chris, I'm the pastor at Libanus uh, Church. Uh, that's the limit of my Welsh this morning, uh, but a, a very warm welcome to you guys. Um, uh, we are, goodness, what are we now? Week four of having our live services, our live in-person services in the building on a Sunday night. Um, and I want to let you remind you, we're going to have another one tonight. Things have changed here in, um, in Conwy, in North Wales. Because as with many many kind of counties of of Wales, we've actually had a, a localized lockdown, so there will be some some differences today. And some of you, uh, gutted to say, won't be able to come over to Conway. Um, so uh, please, please let us know um, today in the comments if you're if you'd like to come tonight, and I'll I'll um, put you down on the list. We have to make some space. And remember as well as Fraser said last week, as we said the week before, you all need to wear masks. Um, and it will be a bit different from how we met before in March. Um, let's have a look at some of these comments. Bob and Morag, good morning. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Morag. Um, just to let you know, I've been praying for you this week. Um, I know I'll call you guys Friday. Um, been praying for you since then. Um, it's great to have you this morning. Guys, let, let us know if you're watching. Um, I can see we've got six viewers. Um, let us know if you're there. It's a, it's a weird thing speaking to a camera. Kind of feels like we're speaking to a void. I've realised I've got Fraser on the screen, so um, <laughs> he's to get rid of Fraser, and I'm going to bring him back. That's a that's a schoolboy error on my part. Bye, Fraser. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the world of, of YouTube. Um, yeah, let's know the comments. Hey, Rachel. Um, hola. Um, speaking a, a nice bit of Spanish, Rachel. You're in the wrong part of the world. Um, but it's nice to see your bilingualism. Uh, right. I'm going to start, and I'm going to read. Um, from Isaiah, um, Isaiah chapter forty-eight and verses nine to eleven. If you've got a Bible, um, please uh, please open it. I'm going to put the, the words on the screen, um, and I, I hope there's some words of encouragement um, and challenge for you uh, as we see uh, what God's word says in Isaiah. Uh, then I'm going to pray. I'm going to hand over to Fraser, who's going to preach. Um, he's going to preach uh, the last week. Um, that we're looking at Jonah. Um, so I hope you've got your your, your Bibles with you and, and, your, and your Jonah heads on. Um, morning, uh, Harry. It's great to have you with us too. Um, now, I know I know that there are a few of you, my wife tells me, there are a few of you who um, who, who, who don't really know how to, to put comments on the screen. Uh, if that's you, um, welcome, a special welcome to you. I know one of those is the lovely Viv. Um, so Viv, I'm going to say a special warm welcome to you. I know every week you've been you've been watching. Um, you're consistent, um, but you, you're, you're getting the comments on the screen is one thing that you're not familiar with. So a very warm welcome to you, Viv. I don't want you to feel excluded. Uh, it's great to have you with us. If you're here and you're watching, underneath your underneath your the picture of the video there should be a little a uh, little phrase that says live chat a little button if you click that you should be able to enter in what you want to say if you want to say anything at all and that applies to any of you guys if you're uh, if you're struggling to get engaging on the comments it's great to have the comments coming in uh lauren morning great to have you with us H how's worcester let us know uh, it's pretty pretty grim out here it's uh, the sun's trying to get through um but it's pretty pretty wet at the minute uh, not raining, just damp. Um, and hello to my dear wife, uh, Lucy. Uh, long suffering. Uh, warm welcome to you, my love. I'll see you in a bit. And John and Sally. Uh, morning, guys. Love from John and Sal. John and Sal, it's great to see you here. You guys are a regular as clockwork on this on this um, on this YouTube stuff. Uh, it's great to have you with us, guys. Keep them coming. And as well, please during the course of the, this morning service on YouTube, please let us know if you're planning to come tonight. Um, I'm going to be preaching from another another big Bible word um, that I hope will bless you and comfort you and encourage you. Um, right, let me get to Isaiah. Right, <clears throat> it says this in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 9. It says, For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. 
for my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. And I wanted to encourage you with a couple of words from here before I hand over to, to Fraser. And one, one is that God's people, Israel, were in captivity. In captivity with the Assyrians, the, the, the whole of Israel had been split after King David. King Solomon was a good king on the whole, but after King Solomon, it went rapidly downhill. And Israel split into two nations, Judah and Israel. And Israel got captured by the Assyrians first. Later on, uh, Judah gets captured by the Babylonians. Um, and is, the Israelites are taken into slavery. And, and Isaiah is saying, you guys... You're in captivity, but this is what God is doing. He's refining you. Just like you put silver into a fire to burn off the waste and you're left with the pure product. Same with gold. That's what God is doing with, with you, Israelites. But interestingly, God's son, God's own son, Jesus, was also afflicted through his life until his death, the ultimate affliction. And even then there was a refining going on because refining doesn't just get rid of rubbish. It also displays what is great and what is good. And in Jesus's affliction, he was displayed as being good and pure. And Hebrews even says this in chapter five in, in, in verse eight. It says it says in in submission, in, in affliction, Jesus learned obedience. And it doesn't mean learned as in became good at obedience. It means displayed his purity, his holiness, his righteousness was displayed in what he went through. Which leads me on to my next point, really. And that is, if, if God has given his own people, his special people, Israel, affliction in order to refine and get rid of rubbish and draw out the pure, and he's done the same with his own son, not sparing affliction from his son, then it's kind of reasonable to think that we might go through the same process. As I've been watching the news over the last few months, last year really, and we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks and months, the 2020 has been a painful year. It's been a painful year across the UK and across the world. But it's also been a painful year for many of us and many of you. Many of us have had a really challenging few weeks, a few days even. Many of us are struggling with relationships. Many of us have struggled with sickness, with loneliness, even with death as we, as we bereave people that we've lost. Even the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, a member of this church from, from long ago, um, long before we came, died. And this is painful. It hurts. And yet there's something in this passage, how God operates and uses affliction to refine to draw out that pure silver, to get rid of the waste. He's got a work that he's carrying out in us. He, he neither spared his own people, the Israelites, or his own son. Let's not lose heart in how God is working. Because in this affliction, in the pain and the struggles that people are going through, God is showing not, not only that he wants to draw out the great, the good and the perfect, he's also showing us how much he values us how much our worth is in him, how secure we are in him, and how actually, if that's what he's doing in our hearts and in our lives, we're in a pretty good place. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to come back to the comments, and then I'll hand over to, to Fraser as, as we continue this service. As I pray, just be mindful of verse 9, which I'll call back up, which is, for my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not be cut off. Because whilst we're not spared affliction, we are spared God's anger, as that is directed firmly and surely on the shoulders of his own son. So, Father God, I thank you for what you are doing in the world. We talked a few weeks ago about being thankful in all situations, but I'm thankful that you are using every situation we face to purify our hearts. My heart needs purifying. I've got bad attitudes and problems, entitlements and assumptions that I make about you and how you should work. And I believe that you're taking some of those away, cleaning me up 
cleaning us up as your people, as your church, using this situation that we're going through, the fact that we're even on a screen and not face to face, the fact that we can't hug or sing. You're using these to shape us up, to purify us. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you also, especially that in your son, Jesus, he bore your wrath against us. He took it. He took it all. So whilst we share in, in Jesus' afflictions, we don't share in a judgment that we deserve. What a privilege and how encouraging. I pray for this morning that you would guide our hearts. You'd work in us. I need and we need your spirit to change us, to shape us, to encourage us. We're a broken people and we need you. Amen. Right, <clears throat> come back to the comments here. Um, Lauren's uh, responded to my question. It's good. Just want to make myself and Gemma, say myself and Gemma had a great morning. The kids made my morning. Thanks, uh, Lauren. Thank you, Gemma, for doing that. Um, uh, I know our kids appreciate uh, much of what goes on there on a Sunday morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know, every Sunday morning uh, we have had children's groups um, being put together by Rebecca. Rebecca Wright, it's been, it's been encouraging. It's been great to see. Um, they're learning stuff uh, alongside what we're doing here on a Sunday morning on YouTube. Uh, so thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Gemma. Um, Mary. Hello, everyone. Brilliant with the subtitles. Uh, thanks, Mary. That's an encouragement to hear, actually. And I appreciate that some of the challenges that you've you've got, especially um, really, really hard, uh, especially with masks. And, and I find I find it when you go into the shop and you're trying to speak to someone, I can't see their mouth moving. I can't see the mouth moving and I find I've lost even the ability to understand much of what people say. Um, not to mention the fact that you're muffled by that, muffled by the mask and the, by the, by the perspex screen. So Mary, uh, I've been praying for you in this respect. Um, it's great to have you here. Um, and I hope, uh, let's keep with the subtitles. I hope they help. And Mary, honestly, if there's any ways we can help with this, please let us know. Um, Rachel, we'll be there all being well. Uh, I presume tonight, that'd be great to have you. And I guess uh, uh, your dear husband and, and, and little kiddies. And Andrew, Andrew and Susie, morning from a soggy lake district. Uh, Andrew, I know uh, if, if Susie's with you, um, she's had an interesting, challenging week uh, of, of revision. Been praying for you guys as well on Friday. I hope uh, that went well. Let us know how, how things went. Uh, God bless you guys. Keep the comments coming. Um, let me go, go bring Fraser back in. And I'm going to pray for him. Morning, Fraser, again. Morning, again. Yeah, sorry about that. That was a. Uh, Fraser said just before the service, guys, right. he said, just just be mindful of the time, Chris. It's eleven o'clock, and at which point we were just kind of both on the screen, and that's how it kind of lasted. So apologies, you get to see the inner workings of our poor administration. Um, Fraser, let me pray for you because <laughs> you're, you're closing, closing our chapter in um, in Jonah this week. And I know when we chatted, I think it was so last Sunday, you said a few things that you wanted to, to bring in um, and that you wanted to introduce in, our, in, our, in your sermon. So I'll, I'll pray for you, pray for you, pray for us now, if that's okay with, with you. And I'll hand over, I'll get off the screen. Cool. Um, Lord Jesus, um, what a journey it's been as we look through Jonah and we've seen your provision, your sovereign control, the response that we have as humans, your mercy that you pour out to us and you pour out to all you've made. You pour your mercy out to the Ninevites, your, your non-Israelite people. You pour your mercy out to the sailors who are just kind of, they don't really care, they don't, they don't mind where they are. And you pour your mercy out to Jonah with his hard, stubborn, pompous heart that believes he somehow deserves your, your love. We've seen all this as we've been going through Jonah. And this morning, I pray for Fraser as he as he draws some comparisons between the book of Jonah and who it points to, really, mm. which is your son, Jesus. Big spoiler alert. But I pray that you would work through what Fraser says. Encourage us. Show us where we have fallen short of your mark. But show us also that Jesus has never fallen short of your mark. And his work is complete. And he has paid for each of us in order that we may be friends with you, God, and live with you forever. Pray for Fraser that you'd speak through him with clarity and he'd work in our hearts this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> All right. 
One th- just want to add quickly before we go on, Fraser, we've got Teresa. Teresa, a very warm welcome to you. It's great to see you on here. God bless you. I'll, I'll hand back over to Fraser. I wanted to add that in. That's brilliant, Teresa. Cool. Good to hear from you, Teresa, um, and everybody else, uh, including those in the Soggy Lake District. Um, and I think it was really interesting, um, Chris, just bringing what, what he did about refinement. Um, and that goes right along with um, what I'm speaking today. And I, I'm so, so grateful for the the ministry of the Holy Spirit because, um, I, I don't know, I just feel um, utterly useless a lot of the time. Um, it's it's a, a great privilege uh, to preach, but it's an awesome responsibility. And, uh, and I just feel um very humbled um when i look into the scriptures um and and part of that is is about um our attitude um and i've entitled my so- uh, sermon this morning uh, what's your attitude um and just to go back to a comment that um mary made um i, I popped around to to see a few people last week or the week before i forget and um and mary was saying how uh, she'd enjoyed having the subtitles. The problem is trying to uh, do everything on the screen. I've got lots of different bits on my screen, and they're all so small I couldn't actually see what's being displayed. So when we had it ticker taping on, apparently I was cutting it off at the wrong place. Um, but we're, we're trying to work through these things. So if you've got any feedback about how we can do things better and just uh, make things uh, easier to, to understand and, and to grasp, please uh, give us that feedback. So... What's our what's our attitude this morning? Uh, so, by way of introduction, um, as Chris has already uh, pointed out, this is the last in our series of sermons from the Book of Jonah, and in line with our stated aim of looking for Jesus in every thread of the Scriptures, and also mindful of the uh, the old adage that I've quoted a few times in the past, where it says the new that's the New Testament. So the new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. I'd like to explore some of the teachings of the book of Jonah from both the Old and the New Testaments. Now, that might seem a bit strange, but um, I hope it will become a bit clearer uh, as we as we carry on this morning. Um, But as you've probably gathered by now, uh, especially if you've been coming on a a Sunday night recently, uh, Christianity has just as much jargon as many other subjects. and one of the terms we learned whilst I was at Bible college was a type, a type. Uh, and the Easton's Bible Dictionary defines it as it, it properly means a model, pattern or mould into which clay or wax was pressed, that it might take the figure or exact shape of the mould. The word type is generally used to denote a resemblance between something present and something future, which is called the antitype. Now, that all sounds quite complicated, but basically what it's saying is a lot of stuff in the Old Testament is pointing to stuff in the New Testament uh, for its fulfillment. And when I looked for a definition of type, because I knew that Jonah is a type of Jesus, um, but I wanted to be able to sort of um, expand on that a a little. So I was looking for a definition of type. Uh, And whilst I was doing that, one that I came across was on Wikipedia. Now, I know that that might not be the most reliable or authoritative, excuse me, authoritative source of information, but this particular one really serves to illustrate this com- concept really emphatically for what we're looking at today, um, because it says typology in Christian theology, that's that's Christian belief and practice, um, more jargon, and biblical exegesis. And more jargon, that that simply means explanation. So typology in Christian theology and biblical exegesis is a doctrine or theory concerning the relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament. Events, persons or statements in the Old Testament are seen as types, prefiguring or superseded by antitypes, events or aspects of Christ or his revelation described in the New Testament. And then it goes on to say, for example, Jonah may be seen as the type of Christ in that he emerged from the fish's belly and thus appeared to rise from death. And I thought that was really interesting when I'm looking for an example uh, of how to describe what a type is. There's numerous examples of types um, in the Old Testament, 
and yet Wikipedia here is picking on Jonah. So my first uh, sermon in this series, I, I called Jonah and Jesus, and I almost called this one Jonah and Jesus 2. <laughs> um, but as we go on, uh, I, I think you'll realise that this book of Jonah is pointing us to Christ. Um, and that's something that I, I really want to land uh, this morning. So my first point is attitude, which you might have got from, from the sermon title. Um, and I've gone against all my uh, my upbringing and, and my, my points don't rhyme this week. They don't start with the same letter or anything. But the first one is attitude. Um, and we've already read and examined the book of, of Jonah quite extensively. Uh, and hopefully by now we're pretty familiar with its account. So I want to concentrate on some of the specifics uh, of its teaching. And uh, from the outset, can I state that much of the book is about the attitude of the various characters within it. Um, we see Jonah's petulance and disobedience and kicking against God's grace. You know, God asks him to do something uh, and he decides to do totally the opposite. We see the sailors being very scared trying to work out their own salvation. They were throwing the cargo overboard. They were rowing harder to try and get to land and whatnot. Um, but also they were disobedient because when they found out why this storm had come, when they cast lots and, and we saw from last week how, how God guided that, um, they knew um, that it was something to do with Jonah. Jonah had actually fessed up at that point and he gave them an instruction. Uh, to throw him overboard but they didn't they carried on trying to row harder um but their disobedience i think had a completely different motive to that of jonah but it was still disobedience we see the ninevites respond to the message of god's impending judgment in repentance most of all we see god's grace and patience towards all involved and that goes back to what chris was just sharing with us about refinement um God has a plan for all of us, a plan for good and not for evil, as it tells us in, in Jeremiah. So I think at the outset then that we can see this book has a lot to say about attitude. And if we then look at the New Testament references to the book of Jonah, we can also see how attitude is addressed. Um, in, in Matthew 12 and verse 38, it says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, that's Jesus, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Now, on the face of it, that sounds like quite a polite and respectful sort of a query. But then he goes on in verse 39 to say, But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, that might seem harsh and unprovoked, uh, but there's a reason for Jesus's response. Again, it goes back to this point that uh, Chris was making about refinement. Um, God, God's not willing to leave us where we are. Uh, a little later in Matthew, we're given some insight into what motivated the scribes and Pharisees when they came to Jesus like this. Um, in Matthew 16 and verse 1, it says, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and to test him, they asked him to show, a, show them a sign from heaven. So this wasn't that they were really after uh, finding out. This, this was basically that they wanted to get one over on Jesus. It was down to their attitude. Um, it says, he answered them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and threatening. Um, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Um, how many of us knew that uh, <clears throat> the sky, uh, red sky at night, shepherd's delight, red sky in the morning, uh, shepherd's warning? How many of us knew that that was uh, from the Bible? But there you go. Um, in verse four, it says an evil and adulterous generation. Uh, sorry, let me get the right one. Uh, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. So this book of Jonah, um, it, it's a sign that's pointing us to Jesus. Um, 
and in matthew 12 jesus went on to say uh, matthew 12 and verse 40 for just as jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth then he says the men of nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of jonah and behold something greater than jonah is here the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of solomon and behold something greater than solomon is here now this is referring to the account in uh first kings uh, chapter 10 uh, verses 1 through 9 when the queen of sheba visited solomon and it tells us in that account that she came to test him with difficult questions which to my mind um you know goes right along with the attitude of the scribes and pharisees coming to christ she came to test him with difficult questions um but she ends up saying in verse six and onwards, um, she said to the king, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom, but I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report that I heard. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. And then she says in verse nine, I think this is um, this is key. Blessed be the Lord your God, who is delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. He has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. So the Queen of Sheba set out with a disbelieving attitude, but she changed it completely and she saw God uh, for who he really is. And that's the whole point of jonah is directing us to jesus as god so we need to have a look at, at our attitude it, it might seem that the attitudes of the various characters that we've looked at are immaterial to us now here in the 21st century um but i would counter that they're very instructional in getting us to confront our own attitude towards jesus <coughs> excuse me uh, our own attitude towards jesus his father who sent him and his Holy Spirit who continues his work. Um, let's face it, all of us have had a bad attitude, um, probably quite a lot. Who, how many of us have seen, <coughs> excuse me, uh, those T-shirts, uh, I've got a bad attitude and I love it. Um, we're not very interested in changing our attitude sometimes. And I'd like to ask the question this morning, what is your attitude towards God offer of grace and forgiveness this morning? What's your attitude towards God? Many of us start out with an attitude like that of the scribes and Pharisees. Um, they thought they knew it all. They were trying to get one over on Jesus. How many of us as teenagers thought that we knew better than our parents? Others are like the sailors, and they'll call out to any God when life gets too tough for them to cope with, but they'll merrily go their own way up until that point. I'm not really interested in God. I'm quite happy with my life until the wheels fall off and then we suddenly want God. Still others are like the Ninevites who sought to oppress those around them and put them down at every opportunity in order to, to big themselves up. Most of us uh, will have been at the receiving end of a bully at some point in our lives. Um, somebody who, who's trying to put others down um, to lift themselves up. The Ninevites were incredibly depraved. Um, some might be like the Queen of Sheba, disbelieving, but prepared to go to great lengths to investigate. So what's your attitude this morning? And whilst we consider that, let's just stop and think about the attitude of Jesus. Surely the ultimate example of our attitude towards God is that of Jesus prior to his arrest, his quote unquote trial and crucifixion. And there's several things that we can pull out of uh, a statement, <coughs> excuse me, that he uh, is recorded in Mark 14 and verse 36. So firstly, we see how close he was to his father because he said, excuse me, he said, Abba. Now that that's the equivalent today uh, of daddy. Um, 
And it just shows the warmth and the depth of the relationship that Jesus had to his father. Even when he knew what was coming, he knew what he was going to go through. Um, the pain, the suffering, the humiliation that awaited him, that was all being conferred upon him by his father, out of his father's love for us. But even in that, he wasn't kicking against it. He said, Abba. And then he recognized, sorry, my fingers aren't working again. Um, he recognized God's sovereignty. He goes on to say, so he says, Abba, but then he says, Father, all things are possible for you. And I think sometimes we forget that. God's the creator and sustainer of the universe. We'll come back to that later. All things are possible for him. And Jesus here is recognizing that. Then he was completely open and honest with him. He says, remove this cup from me. He knew how painful it was going to be. He knew how humiliating it was going to be. And he went to his father. And I, and I remember um, uh, his name escapes me, a Christian comedian. Uh, Mark, somebody or other, it might come back to me. Um, but he said, if you've got a bad attitude to, to uh, sorry, if you've got a bad attitude towards God, just be honest about it because he knows anyway. Um, Jesus here was completely open and honest with God that he didn't want to go through this. But then amazingly, he says, <clears throat> excuse me, yet yeah, not what I will, but what you will. He completely laid aside his own desires. He was totally obedient and subservient to him. And Chris touched on that earlier as well. So again, I ask before we go any further, what's your attitude? What's my attitude towards God this morning? What can we learn from the book of Jonah? So secondly, just give me a moment. My second point is judgment. Judgment. Now, the sailors had to throw Jonah overboard. We know the accounts. Um, basically, God asked Jonah to, to go and preach to the Ninevites so that they would repent. Um, Jonah doesn't think they, they deserve God's grace and mercy. Um, runs off in the opposite direction, uh, catches a, a ship. Um, this big storm blows up uh, and the ship starts sinking. Then uh, they, everybody's panicking what's going on, all the sailors uh, and the master of the ship. And Joan is asleep in the bottom of the ship. And they, they cast lots to try and find out what's going on. Who's caused this? Because they knew it was a judgment. They recognized that. But Jonah told them that they needed to throw him overboard. We'll come back to that in a minute. But they didn't want to because they felt that they would harm him and they'd be culpable for his death. They'd be responsible. And some people have similar thoughts about accepting Christ as their personal saviour. Because if we accept Christ as our saviour, then we're accepting our unworthiness and having the death of an innocent on our conscience and our pride doesn't like that but try as we might there's no other way uh, as we see from Jonah 1 and verse 13 oh hang on there we go um it says nevertheless the men rode hard to get back to dry land so Jonah's told them it's all my fault you need to throw me overboard Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. And although it was the sailors who threw Jonah overboard, in his prayer from inside the fish, Jonah recognised that in reality it was God's doing. So in Jonah 2 and verse 1, it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried. And then it says in verse 20, And you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep. So although it was the, uh, the sailors who physically threw him overboard, Jonah recognised that this was all, uh, it's all about God. Um, furthermore, he recognised 
that God had sent the storm. Because he says, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. So he recognized why he was in that situation. But although he, God had arranged this storm, he'd also appointed a fish to rescue Jonah from it. Now, if we're honest, would any of us say that Jonah deserved rescuing? By his own admission, he didn't. Um, but in verse 17, we're told, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah, Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And as we just uh, said, the storm that Jonah experienced was, by his own admission, a consequence of his choices. In verse 12, he had said to the sailors, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quieten down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come. So he recognized that this was all his own fault. He brought it upon himself. But the storm didn't just affect Jonah. It also affected the sailors. Because Jonah said, <clears throat> for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now, has something like that ever happened to you? Somebody else has made a hash of something and you're the one who's suffering because of it. At first, it might seem grossly unfair that the sailors are suffering on account of someone else's simple attitudes and choices. However, closer examination, I believe, will show us that there's a fund fundamental misunderstanding going on here. Because we've already seen that even after Jonah had told them what they needed to do, he told them, you need to throw me overboard. What did they actually do? It says, nevertheless, <clears throat> excuse me, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they couldn't, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. When they realised that they would have to comply with, with Jonah's instruction, they still didn't fully get it. Um, in verse 14, it says, therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord. And it's interesting, that's all capitalized there. They recognize this is Jehovah God. O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they're recognizing that this is true God. This isn't just any God that they've been calling out to earlier. They're recognizing this is Jehovah God. But they say, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. Now, this also points to Christ in that Pontius Pilate found Jesus innocent. In Matthew 27 and verse 22, when the, 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 the crowd had brought Jesus out for crucifixion, Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, they all said, let him be crucified. But Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? So the innocent Jesus was sacrificed in order to save the guilty, the masses. Now, whilst I was preparing the sermon, I was reading some commentaries. And one commentator I read then went on to draw a parallel, but an inverted parallel with the situation with Jonah and the sailors. Because we've just seen that the innocent Jesus was sacrificed in order to save the guilty, the masses. But this commentator was saying, here we have the guilty Jonah being sacrificed for the innocent, the sailors. However, I believe this misses a fundamental point, which is instrumental in condemning billions of people to an eternity in hell. Because in Matthew 27, and 23 it says but they all shouted the more let him be crucified and then in verse 24 <clears throat> so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing but rather that a riot was beginning he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying I am innocent of this man's blood now Pilate could protest his innocence all he liked but history certainly doesn't see him that way the sailors also talked about innocent blood, 
but the fact is that they weren't innocent either. We know from earlier in the account that they were scared by the storm and they all turned to whichever God might hear. And this is a bit like a truculent teenager denying their father when they don't get their own way. Who, who's had that happen or who has been that teenager? You're not my dad. If you're going to do that, you're not my dad. Ugh. Whether that teenager regards their father as their father or not, does not change the fact that he is. Similarly, God, Jehovah God, is the creator and sustainer of the universe. And as such, he is our heavenly father. Full stop. But if we don't accept this, we've turned our backs on him and we can hardly claim to be innocent. So even when we're going through a storm that seems to have been caused by somebody else and we feel aggrieved and hard done by that we're going through this storm, hang on a minute. We deserve all this anyway. None of us are innocent. So although the storm seemed to have been brought about by Jonah's bad attitude and disobedience, in reality, the sailors had also been disobedient and going in their own way rather than accepting God as their heavenly father up to this point. That brings me on to my third point. <clears throat> Storms. Storms. We might feel that we've behaved impeccably, and I'm talking about the here and now, um, that we've done all that we, we've we been asked to do um, in this COVID-19 pandemic, um, that it's all the fault of others. But the truth is that none of us are innocent. We all deserve judgment, and we're all in need of a saviour. Romans 3.21 says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the law and the prophets were, again, the old, sorry, the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed, that the law and the prophets were pointing to Christ. Verse 22, it says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. We have no righteousness of our own. We're not good enough. We have to accept Jesus's righteousness on our behalf. And that happens through faith in all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, for there is no distinction. And it makes clear what it means by that. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. A bit more. Uh, jargon there but chris covered uh, justification there uh, i think three weeks ago uh on the sunday evening uh, just as if i'd never sinned by accepting the redemption of <clears throat> what jesus has done for us oh for some reason uh i've lost the the next banner uh, my apologies but it goes on in verse 25 it says whom god put forth put forward as a propitiation a payment by his blood to be received by faith this was to show god's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins and i'd just like at this point to to ask uh, to point out a few things and, and to question some stuff it took a massive storm and the imminent loss of their ship for the sailors to turn to god up to that point They'd just been calling on on any god it took this storm and the imminent loss of the ship for the sailors to turn to god it took being over thrown overboard in a massive storm and being swallowed by a fish for jonah to turn back to god it took the warning of god's impending judgment for the ninevites to repent what will it take for you to turn to god and even if we're trying to live for God, we will still be faced by the storms of life. We're all having to deal with this pandemic storm and it can be very unsettling. Excuse me. I know a lot of you are struggling with all sorts of things. So we've got relationship issues. We've got people um, grieving. We've got people losing jobs. Um people falling sick, there's, there's so much stuff that we're all dealing with. However, if we've accepted Jesus as our personal saviour, we can be confi confident that he's got us. 
He's not bound by nature. He could even send a fish to save us from drowning if he so chooses. And I utterly believe that. So with this in mind, with this storm going on and all the stuff that's going on in our lives, and yes, we might have brought it upon ourselves. Or we might feel aggrieved that somebody else has brought it upon us and it's not our fault. None of us are innocent. But at the same time, <clears throat> our attitude uh, has got a massive part to do with this. And I'd just like to, to share with you um, a, a video that I think would be really encouraging. And uh, just please uh, really concentrate on, on the lyrics here. And, uh, and just look at your relationship with God. The new Pixel 4a is packed with all you need for three on. Sorry, um, I didn't mean to leave myself on the screen there. I had, um, I've got lots of screens on, on my screen and it was overlapping. I, I didn't notice that. Um, but I hope you found that an encouragement. Um, if, if you've never truly placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour, can, can I encourage you from this account of the sailors that even in the bleakest circumstances, even the bleakest circumstances cannot separate you from God if you call out to him. And perhaps even more encouragingly, even those indulging in, in heinous sins as depraved as the utterly humiliating torture and, and dismemberment meted out by the Ninevites. I, and Brian went into very graphic detail about what they were like. But even people like that, and not beyond the reach of God's most amazing grace, if you will turn to him in repentance for his forgiveness. I, I, I pray that everybody here will recognise that if you haven't already done so, you can turn to God for forgiveness. And one of the things that, that the, the, the lyrics in that song have been going over and over my head in, in, in this situation, we think our world's falling apart but God is helping it fall into place. And if there's one thing that I think most of us are missing during this pandemic, it's just being able to, to physically be with somebody, somebody to, to be able to hug them. Um, it's really frustrating when you can't. Um, I showed you a, a photo uh, of my daughter and I having a hug at her brother's wedding years ago that I really cherish. And just being able to, to hug somebody like that and I think this song just makes us realize that God wants that relationship with us. And we can have it with him. He's standing there with his arms wide open. Even though he's on the throne, he's utterly God. He just wants to hold us. Will you just be held? Can I urge you, whatever you're going through, to turn to him. Embrace his loving forgiveness and just be held so in conclusion i'd just like to ask us and i'm going to get rid of myself this time there we go uh, i'd just like to to ask a few questions first off oh, if my screen will work there we go uh what is your attitude towards god what is your attitude towards God? Do you accept that you're not innocent and that you deserve judgment? Have you accepted Christ as your personal saviour? When you're going through the storms of life, do you feel that your life is falling apart or it's falling into place? Are you willing to give your life to God on his throne? and just be held let's be close and a word of prayer and i'll hand back over to chris lord we thank you and praise you for for your written word for the privilege it is to uh, to have it in our own language that we can read well we thank you that we can read um help us not to take that for granted either there's many people who can't especially around the world lord help us to be grateful uh, for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us help us to examine our attitude this morning 
I pray that everybody who's listening to this has a personal relationship with you. And if not, that they would have the attitude of the Queen of Sheba, that they would they would come and they would ask the difficult questions so that they might know, that they might be able to find out. Lord, help us to be like the Bereans who, who search the scriptures daily. Lord, when we when we look at uh, things in the Old Testament, help us to look for Jesus. We thank you that your amazing love sacrificed your only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we might be reconciled to you for all eternity, that we might be able to, to just be held in the words of that song from Casting Crowns. Lord, I pray that you'd... Um, just speak to our hearts now. If there's stuff that we need to deal with, that we would get on our knees, uh, either literally or fig uh, figuratively, and that we would deal with that, and that we'd just put you on your throne where you rightfully belong in, in our lives. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Fraser. And... Um... Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll sum up with some comments. I'll see you in a bit, Fraser. Um, sum up with a couple of comments in, in conclusion with that, really. Um, I'll, I'll do the, the latter ones first, um, uh, and then I'll come back to some of the earlier ones in, in, in the comment stream. Um, uh, Lauren, I uh, love this song. Fraser reminds me of when, as a teen group, went to see God's Not Dead in the cinema years ago. And uh, Lucy, uh, Fraser, this song has been like an anthem over the last 18 months. In times when we have no answers, all we can do is hold on to God. Um, and uh, I can vouch for that. I've heard Lucy singing along uh, uh, many times when I come back from work and she's in the kitchen. Um, and Lauren, again, I'm thankful that at the end of the day, even if we don't have anyone else, we have Jesus to go to. It's been my saving grace in recent times. Um, yeah, I, I agree with, with all of that. The um, Where is your anchor? What is your anchor rooted in? Is it in who you are, what you do, your relationships that you have, or is it only in Christ alone? Um, right, let's go back a little bit here. Um, Phil, Phil Jones. Uh, hey, just in case anyone was wondering, two weeks ago I was working on a roof um, and fell off. I broke my back, but I'm recovering slowly, resting and healing. Uh, Phil, um, I'm going to pray for you now. I know I said in the comment afterwards we'll be praying for you, but I thought it'd be worth praying for you now. Um, we, we, we've never met, um, but yet we've built a somewhat of a relationship over the last uh, two, two or three months um, with you on this. So um, let me pray for you. Um, Lord God, um, I just pray for Phil and, and uh, his back. Um, I pray that you would comfort him. Thank you that he's resting and healing well. Um, I pray that you would be the support for him. And it, just in context of what Fraser was saying, I pray that he would be held by you and just be held by you. Uh, thank you for him and for the contact we've had over the last couple of months. Amen. Um, Eleanor or Elena, uh, morning everyone in the sp in spirit. I'm with you. I'm missing you so much. God blessing all. Uh, it's great to have you with us again. Um, and guys, remember, you, you give us a, you've got a few minutes to get on here if you're going to be here. You're going to be in the church uh, meeting in the building tonight at 6.30 um, in Libanus in Tlambevacan. Um, let us know. That'd be great. Also, we have a, a, Zoom, um, a Zoom call after this uh, for 25, 30 minutes. Um, the details are in the detail section of this video. Um, I'll see if I can put them in the comments when I've finished. Um, I'll pray in closing um, and then I will um, leave the screen to hang on for a little bit and you can just leave your comments on. Just a little bit of a warning for you. If, if, you're, um, if you want to come back and watch this video, it's, it's likely that that Casting Crowns video will not be on the stream. YouTube are quite strict with their algorithms and how they pick up YouTube, other YouTube videos in YouTube videos, if that makes sense. Um, so we're going to have to get rid of that. But I'm grateful that Fraser played it. And for those of you who watch live, uh, it's been a blessing. I'm sure. Right, let me pray, and then I'll, I'll get off your get off your screens. Father God in heaven, you are the King, and you rule from your throne. Everything is yours. We belong to you. I pray that you'd help us 
to bend the knee and uh, to follow you, to accept you as our king, as our God. I thank you that well, no matter whether we do or don't, you're still God. But I know in my heart, there are areas and domains of my life that I cling on to, and I don't give you lordship over. Please identify those areas in each of our lives that we may surrender them to you and just be held by you as our Lord, as our Saviour and as our King. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. And uh, I'll see those of you who can be here tonight uh, in the building in, in, um, in Slavakin. It'd be great to see you. God bless you. Bye-bye.